well done, John, as well, because you really do a brilliant job on producing the show. It's fab. Oh, thank you. Well, then I'm going to give a plug. I've just re- a plug for myself. I've just published an <laughs> ebook, uh, an ebook which is called Launch a Podcast, and for the price of a cinema ticket, actually, uh, you can get a 120 page ebook which is all about podcasting, how to do that, how to bring it into your business, how to make one, and there's four training videos as well that you get access to. So mm-hmm. if you're interested in bringing in a podcast into your business, go along to launchapodcast.com and that's and you the- know, <laughs> go on. I was going to say they're just so much fun they are so much fun and the first ones we did I was really dreading it and then after that I, you know once you get your head around what you're actually wanting to say because you've obviously everyone's got something to say of value and to share that is is a real you know it's it's brilliant it's a real treat for everybody as well so I, I really enjoy them. I think it's great. So I would urge people to do it because it's good fun. Yeah, exactly. And we've actually got a new piece of technology which will hopefully hopefully bring you more into the show. Uh, we've added to the website uh, a button that says feedback. And you see it when you land on the website. And if you click on that button, it brings up uh, a dialog box where you just have to click on it and it will record you through the microphone on your computer so you can send us a piece of, of audio audio feedback it will wing its way straight to me and then we can put you on the show with your questions your barks so that's yes. a, that's a really really great piece of technology your barks or your dog barks whichever <laughs> <laughs> all right karen i want to start off here with this really interesting question that you raised on uh, on your facebook page this week mm, yeah i mean my, my question was how long do you think a potential trainer should attend a course or courses before they set up on their own um and my my sort of I was just interested to know what everybody thought because on on Facebook it's like the listeners here you know we have some colleagues you know behaviour colleagues we have some trainers we have some you know n- informal trainers you know people that really are training their dog but do it for competition perhaps or they do it more informally at home and they just want a you know well behaved dog and just some new dog owners so we have a real range of people yeah um, and I wanted to know what people thought because it's no good sitting there and going oh this qualification that qualification if if people aren't looking for it if that's not what they want or what do they what are they expecting to see no exactly Um, exactly just for for me looking through them uh, I thought it was quite interesting I mean everyone seems to mention hands-on experience Mm. um, that you you know you've got you've got to sort of you know be working it's not it's not something you can get through books and I like the whole idea of mentoring as well I mean I know when I when I did my own training here uh, the IMI training um, in Sweden, which is uh, you know a nationally recognised training thing, um, we had you know we had mentors, and it was a twelve. It was actually a twelve month course. I I, yeah. I don't know, but I mean just I mean like for a typical comment here, I think uh, Shelley Heading. I'm sorry, Shelley, mm. if I've got that wrong. If it's not Heading, Shelley says you know I think it's not just about paper. It's about practical work too. Yeah. And I think that that comes through a lot, doesn't it? Yeah, and I mean I completely agree with Shelley. Shelley's a trainer who lives. Um, in Peterborough so she's not far from from where I'm based and um, you know she's a very very down to earth sensible person and has you know lots of experience and I think that's a really good point because she immediately said that and and I think that's true that you know you're handling a dog and somebody's relying on you to sort of you know help their dog learn and mm-hmm. if you haven't had that practical experience it might be it might be in your head how to do it, but every dog is slightly different and every size of dog is slightly different and every dog's personality is going to vary. You know, they're sometimes, um, I always hate to use the word personality because they're not people, but that's not what I'm trying to say. Every dog has a different set of values and a different set of characters mm. that, are, that define what they like, what they don't like. And when you're training a dog, particularly if you're trying to get it to do something that you want, you have to know how to manipulate those different variables. You know, what what do they like? What don't they like? Is it that they like food? Is it that they like toys? Often the dogs that most trainers see don't like food or toys very much. And the reason is either they've not been made valuable enough or they're just not motivated by that because it's not valuable enough to them mm. generally. You know, they'd rather go off sniffing. or they. So as a trainer, if you haven't got the practical experience to know what you're looking for you're going to fail you know yeah. this is not going to work and the, the owner knows about food and toys as well they're not it's not magical news to them so usually they will come to me and say um they don't they don't really want to work for that and so we have to try and find other aspects of that dog's character that think right well what do they want to work for can we make that 
part of their learning. You I know, think, come and make it a potential reward for them. Yeah, I think in terms of sort of training as as becoming a trainer as well, I, Joe Pay talks about shadowing for 12 months and supervised teaching alongside yeah. theoretical learning. Oh, yeah. Um, for, I mean, and that, that, that sort of sounds very much like what I went through. We had to... Um, I, I had to have six uh, six dogs of different breeds and do case studies on each of them. I mean, you know, like the hound group, the terrier group. So you had to have an understanding of, of dogs with because they all have different motivations. Like you know, yeah. the bassets, it's 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 scent and and you know, with the the shelties, it's you know, it's completely different. So I had that, and I had you know. Uh, guest lecturers who were coming in and theoretical learning and then we also had supervised we, we also had to run um what do you call it puppy groups you know like oh sorry yeah. dog training classes where we would have we started off doing it um uh, supervised and then we had to have our own courses we had to run our own courses professional courses and charge for them um and um at a, at a reduced rate if you don't get people to pay then people don't come along that's the yeah yeah that's the thing and then and 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 then we would write case studies and be assessed on that so i mean it really was uh, that's just what i went through and i i assumed actually that all dog training the, the world around was like that yeah, I know. I mean, ideally, that's I mean, that's the kind of thing I was contacted this morning by somebody who's just starting up um, and, um, you know, really, really wants to go forward and be a full time trainer, you know, and um, I haven't asked if I can mention him. So I won't mention him by name, but he knows who he is. And he was talking to me on Twitter um, and he was saying, you know, um, what, what's the first thing to do? And the first thing I said was, you know, t- try and apprentice yourself to another trainer. Now, there are pitfalls with that. Um, if you are a trainer yourself and someone else is apprenticing to you, they might go off and set up competitively to you. So there is a chance that you could be sort of building up your own competition. However, having said that, there are networks of people um, that that will travel, you know, and also if you're training somebody up in the same way, there are an awful lot of dogs out there. An yeah. awful lot. I mean, shadowing, and, I'm going to say shadowing, shadowing as well. What if you're shadowing or, or working with a choke and chain you, yeah, it's, it happens. It you does know, you happen. could be the thing is right because you know let's 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 not beat about the bush here. You can get a dog to produce certain behaviours that you want through what I would call hard methods. Yeah. I mean, you can. Yeah. However, yeah. I'm I'm absolutely ethically diametrically opposed to that but Mm. if you if you know you love dogs you want to work with training you 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 connect with a trainer who uses that method you go along you see it working that that i mean that's operant conditioning for you it is reinforcing with you you are seeing that this is working and um Mm. do you Mm. know what i mean so yeah i agree and i think that's true i mean i can remember somebody asking me several years ago um and they'd been made redundant from their job and they'd started to um embark on a career with with dogs and um the school they were going to to you know to help out um and quite often you have to be you have to work for free i should point out you know it's very rare that you'll get paid until you've got some sort of backing or track record or qualification if you're going to observe classes and things like that um but they were kind of a bit of a what you know yank and crank or whatever they call it you know um methods and they had um a visiting instructor who came from somewhere else who was advising to stare at the dogs in their eyes and how to put them in a dominant down and all this kind of thing that we all used to do sort of 15 years ago and the the, the the problem that I found was, although I could sort of say, well, you know, that's not something that I would do. I don't think it's necessary. I think it's a welfare issue. Um, yes, I know how to do it. You know, why would, that's how I was taught, you know, so many years ago. That's how I was taught. But since then, I've kept my skills up to date and I've had to go and do CPD, which is continuing professional development, which is a compulsory, actually, Um You know, you should, well, I say it's compulsory. It is expected because if you don't keep your skills up to date and then you do something that is out of date and then you get sued, then you've got a problem because you can't prove that you've kept your skills up to date. So with the um, with the APBC you are expected to provide evidence of CPD because of course this is your liability here you know oh, that you're Karen. talking about that, so for those... you know you have to be really you have to be careful and if you really think about it you'd probably never work again because you, it's, it's a real paranoia but what, what I was going to say was just because somebody is in a position of running a course does not necessarily mean that their authority is given or right or whether the method they do is something everybody does you have to make up your own mind about that 
Yeah, I think, uh, but, but be careful of the jargon here, Karen, because there will be people like me listening who haven't got a clue what <laughs> really? APBC or CPD. <laughs> yeah, I know. This is what's difficult for, yeah, I mean, I, I've kind of talked myself into my own problem in a way is that, you know, people who are looking for a trainer aren't necessarily sure which one is going to be, which is a good one, which is a bad one, which is a indifferent one, you know, and, and, and sometimes within each group, there are good trainers, good behaviorists, not so good trainers, not so good behavior. So there's a massive variation on that. So the APBC um, is the Association of Pet Behavior Counselors, mm. um, which is an organization of um, people who are trained in um, or, or assessed rather for their skills in, in counseling owners with their pets behavior now that's not just dogs in that organization there are people who specialize in cats and other species but the majority of uh, people that i work with generally are dog people because that's where that's my background um but they are assessed properly assessed there's no money making involved there's no you know it, it's very thorough and all of the cases are seen on vet referral so in other words it doesn't mean that you have to go through your vet first you can ring up the behaviorist and you can talk to them you know find their name off the apbc website um, which is apbc.org.uk and pick their number give them a ring what they'll probably do if you have a problem with your dog is the first thing they should do is send you to your vet just to make sure that there's nothing medical wrong with the dog now i saw a dog not that long ago that had a, a, a quite a nasty physical problem and thankfully i'd sent i sent them back to the vet because that's my code of practice because there was just it wasn't a case of teaching the dog to sit you know it wasn't like that there was something more going on and the dog had got a chronic pain issue. Now, there'd been another... I'm not this angel here putting myself on a pedestal, but there was another trainer that had been along, dragged the dog up and down the road and was in chronic pain, actually. So because the dog hadn't been sent to the vet first of all, which I think should happen... Um, you know, then then that dog was was put under a lot of pressure and it ended up biting people because it was in so much pain, we oh. we think. Um, now, that, that's easy to say with hindsight. is It's a wonderful thing, isn't it? But I think rather than getting off the topic of what we're talking about, having a code of practice and having the knowledge to, and the confidence to be able to say, look, before I will see you, you really should take your dog to the vet and have it checked out. Because a lot of owners kind of go, well, there's nothing wrong with my dog. But with all due respect... I'm not a vet, the owner isn't a vet, and it's it's a good way of making sure that there's nothing wrong, everything's fine. The majority of the time, nothing is wrong, but there are times, I've seen enough myself of dogs that have come back with maybe an ear problem or maybe, you know, things that are hard to detect. Yeah. That mean that, that that code of practice is really, really important. And we don't always get it right, and don't get me wrong. I mean, sometimes if you're training, it turns into actually this is a behaviour issue, not a training issue, and there's a very, very grey area between the two, very, very different difficult to pick out but you know going back to the debate I mean a, a lot of people have said hands-on experience um you know and so Neil Jones who um who you know has lovely dogs himself and his wife Karen is a, a garland therapist you know they're, they're terrific people has put you know he thinks that you should have two to five years of working you know depending on what you're offering before you actually set up on your own. So t between two to five years. And he's actually mentioned that they've got a trainer near them who doesn't even own a dog. So he says, sorry, I wouldn't trust him. Yeah, that's quite interesting. That's quite interesting because I, I, I'm one of um, Sweden's uh, most uh, famous, famous mm -hmm. trainers. Uh, I, uh, I was talking to her um, a while back about a book project and I said to her oh what kind of dog do you have and she didn't have a dog but how uh, so I mean they're, they're, they're but I, I can guess I mean I, in some ways I think if you're very busy with your work you maybe don't have time for a dog like most people wouldn't have time for a dog yeah. so maybe you know that's yeah I'm not idea yeah, I, but, I should, but having I, said that you kind of would you kind of expect it but then again I think that's um yes yeah, so if you're a yeah, trainer dogs. you know my dogs are little but that doesn't mean to say I can't train big ones because no. I've had big dogs and I haven't got the right home environment for a great big dog to be lurching about because my children aren't that old yet and I think big dogs can be fantastic with little children but my point is I know how much I can cope with at any one time yeah. and I know how busy my lifestyle is. So it's very handy to have everything in a dog portable at the moment. Yeah, um, that's I, I mean, mean, that's the point I'm either, the, I, you know, yeah. I just should just say that, you know, I, I but yeah, no, I mean, I think it's, but I think it's a fair point, you know, if that's, if that, I mean, Neil's, that's Neil's, Neil saying it and I think I think it's a good point and I would probably want to know why, you know, have you, how many dogs have you had now track record? 
I think is important, don't you? If you yeah. can look up somebody and you can see their track record. So the continuing professional development, you know, how many courses are they going on a year? What what if they if they've said they've been in, in the business for however long, um, you know, there'll be there'll be a a, a trail like a breadcrumb trail of, of of information so if you're looking at a potential trainer for yourself or you want to go on a course with that trainer something like that transparency the should be there yeah and transparency it should be there yeah you know, and think... if you find out that they've sold ice creams until yesterday you know then that's not that's not quite the, you know do you know what i mean so yeah. it shouldn't be hidden anywhere now the internet is fairly recent and I think that's fair enough. I think that's one of the reasons the Kennel Club have started the KCAI scheme, which is the Kennel Club's accredited instructor scheme, so that you can map every little bit of what you've done up until the present, pretty much, so that then they know where they're awarding somebody an accredited instructorship. They know what that person's done, you know. So, but if you, like I say, if you have a breadcrumb trail that either doesn't exist or nobody's heard of the person, they've appeared out of nowhere. Mm, you know well, well where have they been and if other trainers don't know them that's always a clue but <laughs> i suppose like, eh? but i suppose if you're if you're if you're looking for a trainer um and you 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 go on go on the web you find someone who's got these um you know B C D A P B C D, but you don't necessarily know. Yeah, you don't yeah, necessarily no. know what they are. You don't necessarily recognise the logo. Um, right. And I don't know as if if I'm thinking like a, a a dog owner here. I don't know as if I would go to another trainer and say I'm thinking of using um, Anna Svensson. Yeah. Um, yeah, so yeah, I mean, yeah, but what yeah. about vets? You talked about vets here. Now I think that one of the, the the vets could have a good role in this because if you have a puppy, for example, at you know you get the dog at eight weeks, and most I don't know here in Sweden, you know, all breeders will vaccinate the dogs at eight weeks before they hand over the dog to uh-huh. the buyer. But then at twelve weeks, the uh, the dog will need its second shots, uh-huh. and it's at that point that I think that often people will say to the vet, "Well, you know, I'm I want to get the dog trained, I want to get it in classes, blah blah blah." I think at this point, you know, if vets working in collaboration with trainers who have the right kind of quality, that to me sounds like sense, you know, that your vets would recommend or. Yeah, yeah. They, um, they, I mean, vets build up obviously quite a close working relationship with local trainers, um, local behavior people, because. You know, they don't necessarily do that in-house. A lot of vets are starting to offer, like, basic behaviour advice in-house. And, you know, the APBC, who I've just mentioned, run what they call CPD courses for mm-hmm. veterinary staff so that they've got a good idea of, you know, pain behaviour and certain ways to deal with cats and how to handle dogs in a particular environment or maybe handling aggression within the practice so that they don't get sure, hurt. You but know, they are clinicians. Of- they are clinicians. Their yes, training yes. is purely and within... They get, you know, exactly. And they don't get very long. Um, and you know it's not necessarily the practical part of what to do I mean every vet practice is is different because they all vary according to how they like to run things but usually a vet will get feedback um, and you know they'll get good feedback and they'll get bad feedback sometimes they will just give you a folder and say pick who you like because they don't necessarily want to recommend people because they don't have they haven't worked with them themselves so you know it's worth asking them because they have been in the area for a while and they'll know sort of this and that um but i think the other absolute standard if you're looking for i think for a behaviorist there are the apbc or the uk rcb which is the um, uk registry of canine behaviorists and they have all been assessed and like i say they're not big money profit people so they are organizations that are you know following the the, the rules as as and a very good very clear code of practice without trying to sell dvds or make money out of it or try and sell you courses or things like that so um you know you could do that if you're wanting a trainer obviously the association of pet dog trainers are you know they're out there i'm sure hundreds of people are shouting at the podcast now going well i know an apd trainer and they're not very good but you still have to make your own mind up about individual trainers because you know it's 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 a it's you've signed up to it they've signed up to it they should have a good code of practice they should have an ethical code but it might not be right for you and it might not be right for your dog so this is something that i think at least they've bothered at least they've bothered to go and take the take the courses and go and get the letters after their name. The British Institute of Professional Dog Trainers sort of outlived the APDT. They were the ones that were around when I was starting, who I went and qualified with, um, and they do different levels of training. You know, if someone's actually bothered to go and spend a week there, um, getting not learning, 
getting that accreditation. So you have to have instructed for several years before you go and do that mm, I um, think at certain levels, you know, so you've got, you know, they're testing you when you get there. They're not training you when you get there. I think my position, my position is because obviously Karen, this is really something that you're really passionate about and something that we can, you know, we will be returning to again and again. I, I, yeah. I, I do think, and I know that the part of the community that listen to this show are trainers and it's, mm. it's, it, but it's also, it's also your, your, your regular dog owners too. And I think the thing that what we're saying here is that as a dog owner, everyone out there who works with training, that works with dog behavior, canine behavior, they are going to have their own particular take on you know what works yes yeah. yep they have, may have training hopefully they do have training but there are going to be different approaches in the same way that your dentist will differ from you know the, mm. the one down the road that we do yeah, have different yeah, approaches absolutely. Yeah, but I, absolutely but i think as a as a dog owner it's really important that you are looking for a trainer who is very transparent about their their background their experience what they they've been doing what their 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 methodology is why they choose that methodology how and if they are accredited who that accredited you know because as a dog owner you don't necessarily understand the 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 accreditation if that's the right word that you don't they don't actually understand all those things so i Mm. think it's up to you as a trainer to explain through transparent we've got the internet now on the web you can make your qualifications your expertise known i know here some of the trainers that i really admire they show all their qualifications they show all the courses that they've attended they Mm, show mm -hmm. you know the the extra development they show the kind of dogs that they've worked with Uh, uh, transparency does 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 that kind of make sense karen yeah totally you know i mean and i mean just to go back to the facebook debate i mean lisa hicks said you know she'd love to get into working with dogs as some kind of trainer looked into it on websites and by asking local trainers but it's all just confused the hell out of me is what she said and that's absolutely right you know look and get a feel Get a feel. Are yeah. qualifications important? Was the original question, you know, how long do we think they should have been training? Not necessarily one and the same. You could have a qualification after a weekend, you know? You who? could go you can uh, go and buy what, a PhD. Your, <laughs> well yeah, I mean, you know, that the, there's ways to there's ways to get these things, you know, and, and you can just sort of put whatever. And it's hard to associate what you've done. Track record length of experience practical handling um i mean i commented when um, several people said no they need experience you know it's like trying to learn to swim out of a book you can't learn to swim out of a book well you could have a pretty good theory but you know you've got to get in the water and you've got to give Practice. it a go so so yeah so uh, but there's almost something we've missed here john and that is the people element if you're taking a dog and you're training it that could be your own dog it could be someone else's but most of the people that we work with, it, most of the dogs we work with rather are owned by people. And this is the other half. I mean, we've only talked 50% of the debate, in my opinion. The other half is getting the owner to do it for you as a trainer. Here's what you do, blah, blah, blah. Now I, know, I need you to do it. And every person is incredibly diverse, different abilities, different physical abilities, different mental capacity, different learning ways you know all sorts of things and we've got to encourage them to work as a team yeah i saw to suss people and honestly folks if you're out there and you want to work with dogs you have to like people in my opinion i saw some (laughs) i saw something yesterday when i went to marbury center and uh, the mall just near me and there was a the car the car that i parked next to is owned by one of sweden's um very very well-respected uh, trainers and uh, her car white volvo huge logo down the side and uh, it literally translates as a uh, dog owner coach you know she she yeah. doesn't call herself a dog trainer or a canine behaviorist or whatever it's it's she is a a canine owner trainer yeah. Yeah. <laughs> which I, I mean that's why that's why the strap line for intellidogs is because dogs have people because the dogs aren't looking on the internet for information. You know, it's us that have the problems. If we if we just let the dogs roam around, I'm pretty sure they'd sort themselves out. They'd probably all get run over. They'd get starving like you see feral dogs. That's not really, you know, if you've got a dog in this country as a pet, I'm not talking about rescue, I should point out, or therapy. That's slightly different, you know, because you might be training a dog up and then passing it on to an owner, or you might be um, helping dogs in rescue where there aren't owners. You know, that is an area where you probably aren't working so much with the people in one sense, but then you're looking at homes for the dog. So you've still got to have a really good people sense. Yeah. Um, and you've got to try and persuade them, haven't you? I mean, oh, you've got to try and get yeah. them to do what we want. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's 
it's not, I mean, everybody was right, I think. and There wasn't one opinion I didn't agree with on there. Everyone's got their own opinion and their, their opinions are all correct. That's why we've got to sort out what is suitable for us, what is suitable for our owners, what's ethical, what's safe, what's healthy for the dog, you know, what the vets are happy with. Um, you know, and take it from there. And and it's a massively diverse area, but the big things are, yeah, track record, experience, handling, and people skills. How many times have you heard, oh, they fell off, the, the person, you know, they, they're really good with dogs, but mm, it's like they fell off the side of a mountain when it comes to people, you know, and you think, yeah, you know, we've all met people like that in every sphere, not just our industry. Mm. Um, just to um, add in and finish off, um, you know, um, Davina McCall, who is one of the television presenters over here, who's very well known, her trainer, Jackie Wren, um, commented on this debate. Now, she is obviously a personal trainer, so she does Davina's fitness videos with her. She's done a huge series of those um, with her husband, Mark, as well. And she says, it's the same in my industry. I tell the personal trainers that once they have their qualifications, they must work in a gym for at least a year before they start getting their own clients. So it's not just us. I think every industry is the same. If you're a, if you're a beginner, you have to be patient and get, get cracking on doing doing things bits and pieces and getting your experience around you before you let yourself loose <laughs> <laughs> that's a good i think that's a good that's a good point to stop on this topic like i said karen you it's obviously something incredibly passionate to you and 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 you know this the same with me i i yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm. It's all about improving the life that we have with our dogs. That it it's, yeah. it's, it's together. It's that interaction. It's that interaction. And I don't think. And also, don't get me wrong. I mean, I don't think anyone in this debate that's talked on Facebook or yourself or, or myself is sitting there on a, on a sort of big high throne saying, "Oh, listen to us. We're dispensing. You know, you you shall follow these instructions." These are everybody's thoughts you know this is everyone's opinions and they're important opinions you know it's 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 an opinion it's not absolute fact you've got to make up your own mind and you've got to learn to trust you know do you trust what this person is saying uh, you know because everybody cocks things up everyone makes mistakes everyone can't quite get what they want to get sometimes so there's no perfect utopian dream of what your dog trainer could be like you just have to kind of go for what's what pattern fits to what you want yeah exactly all right karen um we've been going quite a long time so i think we're going to take one thing from crufts uh yeah, and we'll okay. we'll we'll return to 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 more interviews from crufts which interview are you going to give us well let me think well i've got some brilliant brilliant people on there but what i'd really like i've got a chap who does um a lead sleeve now what it is you put it on the dog's lead and it can give you a cautionary message to anyone who might want to stroke the dog so what are it you know what in my experience if you put a jacket on a dog a working dog people immediately assume that that dog's absolutely fine to approach it's a, an assistance dog or a support dog of some sort well clearly when they're working, it's not, but that t that tends to be my experience, and I'm sure that there are assistance dogs out there that might disagree, but it tends to attract attention. Where are some dogs that really don't want to attract attention, but they might look cute, they might be, you know, keen as long as you don't touch them, or, you know, they might be just a small, easily approachable type dog, but not every dog likes to be stroked or touched. So what they've done, it's called um, Gizapore is the company. They have developed a sleeve that fits on to the dog's lead and it's a reversible sleeve. So one says caution and it's bright red with yellow embroidery and you can get one that fits on their collar as well. Um, and then the other side is green and it says ask before stroking. So it's not, it's not sort of saying this is a dangerous dog. What it's saying is just, just don't, you know, don't don't go crazy. You have mm. to ask me first. And I think that's a really, really good idea. I haven't used it myself yet. I'm going to review it because I'm quite interested to see what happens when I put it on my dogs. Because although my dogs are absolutely fine, they do attract a lot of attention and people just stick their hands out, particularly children. So I, it's very unscientific. I'm going to have a little go myself and see what I think. It needs proper testing. But I thought people would like to hear from uh, from from them. So I'm going to I'm going to play that interview now. All right. Now, we've got a new innovation here um, at Crufts. Now, this is a quite an important one for those of you that have dogs that maybe aren't so comfortable with being stroked or those of you that don't really like children coming up and just sticking their hands out to your dog. And um, 
David Daly, who is the um, well, the head of Gizapore, is going to tell us a little bit more about the um, awareness behaviour sleeve. So, David, tell us a little bit for those people that haven't seen it. What what are we doing here? What have you got? Okay, well, it's a it's a colour coded attachment that actually goes on the dog lead or leash and also onto the collar. And it, what it'll do, it'll pre warn others, dog owners, the public, if the dog is friendly or the dog is dangerous. I've used the colour, the traffic light colours. So the red is the caution, and then we go on to the green, which is the ask before stroking. So across the actual green sleeve, you've got ask before stroking embroidered on it. Um, it's, it's visible, it's, um, it's a fantastic product. It, it's illuminous, it's reflective. In on the product as well, there's a little pouch where you can put your poo bags and your dog treats. So this attaches to the lead, but there's also a collar attachment as well, is that right? A slightly smaller one that goes around the dog's neck? That's correct, yes. A smaller one, probably half the size, that actually goes on the collar, which, which is ideal for when the dog is off the lead, having a run round. People do know to be cautious once they've approached that dog. Now this is a really innovative product. What sort of feedback have you had so far? The feedback is just absolutely amazing. I've just been in a meeting with the, the president of the American Kennel Club who is actually taking a sample back to America with him on Tuesday. They actually word, their wording is actually ask before your pet. Right, yeah. So they're taking that back with them. Um, and he did say to me, if I wanted 30,000, could you do it? Let's, let's, fingers crossed, let's hope, let's hope. <laughs> but I've just been in that many meetings with different dog behaviourists here. It's just a great way of reducing the amount of dog bites that are happening. So if somebody wanted to get one of these, what, what are you selling them at? Okay, well they're on sale they're on the website, which is gizapaw.co.uk. That's G-I-Z-A-P-A-W. And they're on for £9.95 plus P&P. So is that that's for just the lead or is that for lead and collar or how do people work it? No, that's actually for the sleeves, which yeah. go on to anybody's lead. So it's an attachment for, for, a, for, for a lead. So, um, you know, people can order it if they're not confident with their dog's behaviour. It's at least, a, you know, a bit of a precaution for other people to know first. And it also, I think, probably helps people, you know, ask people to approach in a slightly different way, don't you think? And actually help their own dog adjust to people coming over to it. That's correct. And obviously, in on the pack, Gizapore have actually compiled their own dog safety leaflet. So, on the back there, you can actually see the reasons for the dog being on green but quite clearly there it's saying ask before stroking which is the key message that we must get over to children to start the educational project then you go into ask ask me owner before stroking which I've just said let me sniff your hand don't make loud noises etc etc but then if the dog or the sleeve is on caution the reasons could be on being trained I'm from a dog's home I've been to the vets so I'm not feeling 100% new owners mood swings not with my master or dangerous absolutely fantastic david thank you so much thank you cheers so that's about it for this week if you've got any comments about the show or questions do get in touch you can contact karen on twitter and that's twitter.com forward slash wildpaw and if you go along to her facebook page uh, which is Karen Wild Wildpaw. You'll see some pictures of Karen at Crufts and on the back of her T-shirt, you'll see that she's got the at Wildpaw, <laughs> <laughs> which I thought was great, Karen. Well, it's so difficult at Crufts because there's so many people that I want to meet and, and I still had people saying, oh, you know, everyone kept saying, oh, she was here a minute ago. And, you know, it, it, it's it's absolute like organized chaos and the more people that come up and say hi the, the nicer it makes the whole experience so it's a good way of having you know have your twitter name slapped across your back so that people can come up and say hi or, hi, or, or kick you up the back side yeah. depending on what they think but you know it's um you know so yeah and it's hard to get noticed in a big crowd like that so yeah i've met i met some great people that came and went oh i'm so and so off twitter and it was brilliant yeah. really good <laughs> so if well if you haven't met karen in real life or me do come along to twitter and say hi at wild 
Paul, that's Karen, and it's at John Buskell, J-O-N-B-U-S-C-A-L-L. To get in touch with me, if you want to leave some feedback or you've got some questions about the show, um, I'd go along to Karen Wild Wild Paw Facebook page and you can ask a question there or come along to the IntelliDogs website. That's IntelliDogs.com. And there you'll see, uh, well, you'll see the blog post to go along with this show and you can leave questions or comments there in the blog post or you can leave a voicemail through the feedback button that we've put on the page and it's great it's great to get your voice on the show we'd really love that yeah don't be shy come on come on so and uh, if you'd like to put together your own training manual you can do that by uh, going along to Karen's website and uh, there's some great tips and tricks there just to uh, that you can put together to build your own training manual and like I said earlier if you want to start your own podcast get in touch with me or get my ebook at launchapodcast.com well I think that's just about it Karen a long episode this week but lots of important stuff <laughs> yeah definitely yeah and, and you know I'd look forward to more feedback on that as well come and join in the debate and we'll be back very very soon with another edition of the wild poor dog podcast thanks very much for listening thanks bye <laughs> <laughs>